Hi, in a previous video, we took a look at the security of the RFID uh, PayWave, PayPass, whatever you want to call it, Nearfield comms system in uh, modern credit cards, uh, be they uh, Visa, MasterCard, or whatever. They contain a coil in here, which allows you to do a contactless uh, payment. Uh, they're very common in Australia. I know they're uh, not common or not available in some other countries, but very common here. You just basically tap the things and go, and you can actually see the inductive coil inside there, these little, you know, a couple of turns around the outside of the card like that. And so uh, click here if you haven't seen the previous video and watch that first. Now, somebody on uh, Twitter pointed out that you can buy active RFID scanners. Uh, you can actually get them from the local JB Hi-Fi store here in Australia, which is like a local, uh, you know, they sell electronic uh, consumer goods, TVs and DVDs and computers and everything else they sell an active RFID jammer. So I thought we'd do a teardown of it and also give it a try to see exactly how this thing actually works. It is an active one, it's not a passive one like we looked at. You can just use some alfoil. For those who don't know, alfoil, aluminium foil, or as Yanks like to call it, aluminum foil. No one in Australia calls it aluminum foil. Aluminium foil, more than good enough. If you put that um, just like, on one side of the card uh, is good enough in your wallet or your purse or whatever, good enough to protect you against um, any skimming or fraud or anything like that if, per if a person uh, is close to you with an RFID reader. And this is an active jammer instead of a passive attenuator, which is what aluminium foil is, or you can buy wallets or purses that I looked at in the previous video. So this one's actually, it looks like it's from Australian company. It's called the Armour Card, armourcard.com.au. It's um, electronic jamming technology, 13.56 megahertz, only works on that uh, frequency, and it's supposed to be uh, powered, so it's supposed to be a battery inside this thing. It's not just a passive thing like these uh, cards are, where they basically, just work with the uh, magnetic field that they pick up from the uh, reader slash uh, transmitter. Uh, this one actually contains a battery and actively jams it. Um, so, yeah, I thought we'd take a look at it. A, does it work? And B, hopefully, we can do a teardown of what's inside this puppy. Let's go. If we have a quick look at the card itself, it's, uh, it's reasonably thick. So it's not credit card thin. It's like at least... Uh, Oh, two or three credit cards or something like that. But considering that it contains the circuitry, the battery, everything else, then, you know, yeah, that's okay. Designed to slip into your wallet or your purse and actively, continuously, actively jam. And it's got a little uh, capacitive touch switch on here that allows you to... Uh, just test the thing or turn it off if you're doing a transaction. But it'd be a pain in the butt if you've got to get this thing out of your wallet along with your credit card and then, de you know, and then, well, let's try it. Press it and... Bingo, it's flashing. There we go. So it does have an internal battery source. Uh, it's disabling the jamming and doing the battery test. Haven't read the instructions. Presumably uh, green means the battery is okay. But uh, it's also got an active jamming light, which uh, hopefully should come on when we put our uh, Nearfield comms mobile phone next to it and try and actually read a card. And if we flip it over to the other side here, you can actually... Uh, so maybe start to see a pattern of stuff inside there, but uh, you can actually see the coil around the outside. Check it out. There we go. It looks like they got a couple of turns of this thing, quite a few going all the way around. You have to get it the right light, of course. There's the little via down there going down into the board. So we've just got a uh, PCB material with this uh, plastic sandwiched either side, and it's been quality assurance tested. So let's put our mobile phone up with an NFC uh, card reading a tag. I've turned the NFC uh, on and let's see if that, yep, it comes on. Sure, well, it fla yeah, it's flashing. There you go. And that will probably coincide with the uh, packets because as we saw in the previous video, the NFC uh, is continually scanning out. It's continually sending out a signal, uh, a uh, packet we're trying to get those cards to wake up. So, yeah, it can detect that and work. How far back? Oh, it's got to be... Let me let me try it. It's actually got to be fairly close. It's got to be like a couple of centimetres, an inch away at most. So, yeah, it's not terrific. So, presumably, you don't need to uh, disable this thing because this thing's going to typically stay in your wallet or your purse or whatever. Then you're going to get your card out and you're going to uh, tap it and uh, do your 
uh, payment, of course, like that. So, you know, look, it still worked, no problems at all. And that was, you know, like six inches away from the thing or something. So, you know, yeah, you don't really need to disable it. It's always active. It's always there ready to receive and then jam. So let's try that again, but have our card next to that. And yeah, you can actually see it still flashing through there, and that is not going to scan that at all. So yes, it does seem to work, and yes, I've played around with it, and as long as you keep it, maybe if we keep it this far away, well, yeah, there we go. If we get to a point where you take it, a, once again, you know, five centimeters away, um, something like that, an inch or two away, you can easily still read your uh, card. So yeah, it's got to be right next to it. In your wallet so right there if you've got a large purse um, or something like that then it, it actually may not be that effective and check this out in the store where I bought it from JB Hi-Fi I couldn't believe this it was absolutely hilarious look where it is positioned to the F post <laughs> terminal there right next to it so you've got an R active RFID jammer right next to the RFID reader and yes I did actually have problems with it and yes the shop assistant said oh yeah the cards we have to put it at a certain angle to make them work oh so right there, that's a downside of one of these uh, active jammers. It looks like it has to be reasonably close, as does uh, the alfoil as well. But at least the alfoil can uh, go like in the outer pocket of your purse or something or your wallet uh, that then folds over. It's going to protect your card fairly well. Whereas this thing, um, you know, it has to be close. So just be aware of that. Right, so just like in the previous video, I'm going to use my magnetic uh, H-field probe here. I'm going to be able to put that on there, and then we're going to be able to uh, capture uh, some packets on there and exactly and see exactly how it's jamming it. Oh, that's not a bad one. In fact, you can see the decay. Uh, well, you can see it ramp up in amplitude as I approached it and then uh, ramp back down in amplitude. So it just captures some data here without the armor card uh, card. So this is a proper uh, credit card transaction. Uh, as we saw in the previous video, this is the 100% uh, modulation that uh, basically pings the uh, card. And then we've got the data return over here. You can see this is the modulation coming back, the 800 kilohertz or so modulation on and the data coming back from the credit card. So this is what must get uh, spoofed inside this uh, armor card. It must be just sending back random data or doing something else. And as we saw in the previous video, the ISO standard uh, for these RFID contactless cards actually contains an anti-collision uh, system. So it's designed to have multiple cards in the field. So, But in theory, um, it shouldn't be hard to actually um, spoof this at all and just, just corrupt it with just random data all over the place. You know the window, uh, the time window when it's actually uh, supposed to happen. So, you know, you can just go in there and just modulate um, randomly and just screw everything up. It's probably not that hard at all. Okay, I'll do that exact same mark capture again with the same trigger point and everything else. But now I've got the armor card directly under the credit card. So let's give it a go. And whoa, bingo, look. That's very periodic, isn't it? That's periodic modulation right there. And it's the same. It does not change at all. So once again, here is our, uh, here is our phone, our RFID reader, uh, pinging this, doing its 100% modulation, and then it expects something bad. But look, this thing started started to corrupt during like it's during the whole time period before and after this it's just always doing it so it looks like as soon as it detects any sort of field at all it's just continually modulating like that so that will definitely completely screw it up yeah that's that's exactly how it's doing it and that's all you need to do um, either, but in this case, it's not just random data. It's just complete. It's just continually uh, repeating in that frequency range that we had before. We can get in there and actually measure that, but it's going to be a similar uh, frequency range to uh, what's expected by the ISO standard, of course. But they're just continually pumping this crap out, and that's what causes the interference. That's going to work a treat. And yep, there you go, uh, 862 kilohertz, round about that 847. I'm not going to get in there and dick around. So it's within the uh, modulation frequency that the RFID protocol expects, and that's how it's screwing it up. Too easy.
And by the way, for those wondering uh, if you need to fully encase your credit card in Alfoil, the answer is no, you don't. It just has to be near enough that it uh, affects the uh, the transformer properties of, because that's effectively, as I explained in the previous video, effectively what this is, a transformer with a primary and a secondary here. So let's give that a try. Put it over there. Nope, doesn't work at all. Maybe if we raise it by that, I don't know the thickness of that, what, 15 millimeters or something? Pro Yep, got it. Okay, so it needs to be somewhere under that. So there you go. That's not very uh, thick at all. Let's try that. That will maybe work. No, no. Let's try a thicker one. Not as thick as the uh, tape here. And... Oh, yeah, we're able to get that. So there you go. Maybe 10 millimeters within that. Rule of thumb. And I know people wanted to see this thing torn down before I turned it on, but in this case, it might be a destructive teardown. I'm not uh, sure. I'm not sure if it's potted inside, whether or not this is just a cap, which will just uh, pop off or whether, you know, I don't know, I have to dremel the thing. So I wanted to try it first, but anyway, let's tear it apart. And it is starting to uh, snap off, not easily, but it's coming. And bingo, this solves the first uh, question I had, which is what battery does it use inside this thing? It's got a lithium manganese dioxide uh, cell in it, and I'll link in the data sheet uh, down below. We can still make out the part number here. Uh, 3 volt nominal, 100 milliamp hour capacity. And even though this thing looks like a lithium ion uh, rechargeable battery, it's not because that wouldn't work. That'd be silly because you, would, you, know, you hardly ever would use this thing in a magnetic field. And even then, it's only for you know a few seconds you wouldn't get the energy required in order to uh, recharge a battery. So it's got to have a primary battery in there. How long it lasts? Probably actually many, many years because this thing does not require much at all. Low power micros, of course, are a dime a dozen. They you know run on the sniff of an oily rag. And um, you know even on the tiny coin cell, this is like 100 milliamp hour uh, capacity. It's a fairly uh, decent size, uh, you know, grunty cell for this kind of application. And all you've got to do is have that low powered, it doesn't even need to be a micro in there, it could just be discrete uh, circuitry. That just, as we saw, on because it's a regular periodic uh, pulse, you could just do that with just, you know, jelly bean logic stuff and uh, get away with that. And all you've got to do, as I showed in the previous video, is, well, I've got it here. There we go. All you've got to do is have the micro like this and then just have a treat, or in this case to be a MOSFET, that just puts a load across the coil. And that's all it is. It doesn't really take any, you know, any major energy to switch on that MOSFET and put that load across the coil. So you could run for years on this thing. So I wouldn't worry, I wouldn't be concerned with this thing uh, going out. I'm sure they've done their engineering to, you know, ensure that it lasts for a long, long time, you know, five years, you know, basically uh, shelf life of the battery kind of thing. And this thing actually still works a treat even after taking that off, haven't taken the front off yet. And uh, there we go. And if we hook that up, there we go. It's still flashing away. So, you know, the, uh, the LEDs on these things are going to take uh, the most current on this thing. So it could, like, just, it may not even bother to detect the field. Of course, it could just be continually going, switching that transistor on and on in that fixed period. Because that's all you have to do. And it takes bugger all energy to switch a MOSFET like that off and on. So, you know, why not? Just keep doing it all the time. It only needs to run at that 800 uh, kilohertz or whatever. It's bugger all. And that there is no doubt our um, in-circuit programming interface for our uh, micro, whatever that happens to be. Got to get the top side off. It is sort of like heat staked uh, in here, the uh, plastic. So they just got some holes in there. So hopefully we can pop the top off and have a look at the circuitry. And of course, even though I said you could do this with like jelly bean uh, logic kind of stuff, you know, we've got to have the ability to read the capacitive uh, touch sensor here and flash the lead and do stuff like that. So no doubt it's just some low power micro, like a MSP430 or something. Oops. <laughs> That's what you get when you're trying to use a knife to uh, try and slice across. I was being quite gentle, but it looks like it hooked some of the uh, case of the battery. And yeah, that's the... Uh, magic fluid and if this was uh smell -a vision um yeah you'd be able to smell like and smell that it smells like uh isopropyl alcohol but no worries look at that still works a treat and uh yep <laughs> beautiful well, there we go l536 something or other off the top of my hat i'm not sure uh what that one is i'll have to give that a bit of a google i'm surprised they use a crystal in there 
you don't really need that sort of uh, accuracy. So just an internal, uh, the uh, internal RC oscillator probably would have been enough inside a micro, I would have thought anyway. So yeah, that's all there is. Um, that's the only circuitry in there, just a bunch of uh, passives and that one micro. That's it. And the coil on the outside, of course. Now our battery died, but granted I have come back the next day and am shooting this so it all just uh, dried out. So it just hooked on a couple of uh, triple A's there and I've been uh, trying to probe around the signals here and sorry, I haven't been able to find anything. And this is not the least bit surprising because the transistor on here, there is no external transistor. There's no, you know, SOT23 uh, package or anything like that. So there's no external transistor. They're obviously using an internal transistor in the micro to drive the load across the coil here. But of course, it's going to be, well, it's going to be a MOSFET um, CMOS output, of course, but it's going to be an open drain one. So if you go probing there, you're not going to see anything switching on the output because it's just going low, low, like, like it's not, you've got to have something, uh, you've got to have an induced magnetic field to induce a current in here so that you can actually have a current flowing through the uh, coil and the uh, transistor in, or in order to see it switch. But I do believe that it is simply continually switching the load across this coil. And of course, if there's no external magnetic field, there's no current. So you can do that with essentially uh, no uh, current a consumption penalty. So unfortunately there's nothing uh, interesting to see if you probe around on this thing uh, but we've seen it with our H-field uh, probe here that it's basically continually I'm not going to use the word transmit, it's continually modulating uh, this coil here, continually putting a load across this coil so that as soon as an, a coupling field comes in, then it will instantly start uh, modulating onto the primary of the transformer here and it's going to corrupt the thing because... You know, that's just going to screw your day. If you're the reader here and you're expecting a uh, coded uh, protocol back out of the modulation here at the 847.5 kilohertz modulation uh, frequency, then you're just going to get the data is just going to be garbage. It's, you know, it's going to completely screw it up. So, yeah, this thing is going to work a treat. No worries whatsoever. And it's drawing about uh, four microamps for those playing along at home. Just sitting there like that. And if we go there, the lead obviously will, uh, huge, the lead will jump that right up. No worries. And if we bring our reader close to it, what do we get? Yeah, it jumps up to, well, 300. It's doing a few things there. But yeah, it's jumping around the place. But you've got to be careful actually using a uh, magnetic coupling thing like this on to essentially what is we've got like you know loops in here we've got wires it's gonna and we're looking at uh, microamps here so you've got to be careful this doesn't induce something into the wiring and the test setup and that's a real concern here so I wouldn't take those figures at face value it's yeah you know, this is going to be tr something that's a bit tricky to measure so i'm just dicking around here seeing what we've got but yeah you would have to uh check your test setup and <laughs> rule out that you're not actually uh inducing current into uh either your test setup your wiring uh the ground system or anything like that and of course this thing has a patent so we can go in here and have a look at uh, from a company called Harris Tees Proprietary Limited here in uh, New South Wales and they have had this uh, granted apparently so we can look at the details. So here it is, inhibiting unauthorized contactless reading of a contactless readable object. Patent speak yet again. They actually call it an antenna, they don't call it a uh, coil and uh, basically I won't bore you with the uh, details here, you can read it for yourself, but it's basically saying that it uh, uh, is sending out it emits the jamming signal in response to receiving the interrogation signal so it looks like it's not continuously doing it even though I think that's a perfectly valid technique and it appears to be what they're doing but maybe they couldn't get the patent on that maybe they had to you know get it to get the interrogation signal before the before they emit the jamming otherwise it's a like it's a different use case usage case for patenting the idea perhaps so yeah anyway that's what it seems to uh be and blah 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 we can go and read all the details and blah, it's as boring as the proverbial bat poo
But they are saying here that uh, about three centimetres of the jamming uh, device, and they're saying about two centimetres here. So which one is it? I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, it's that's what we saw, basically. It needs to be within, you know, a couple of centimetres of this thing to be uh, effective. Although at a larger range, it could actually be annoying if it is transmitting all the time or it's just periodically thinking it's got... Uh, it's being interrogated, then it might just transmit something. So as we saw in the example, if it's sitting next to the FPOS terminal on the counter of the store, that could be, you know, that could be a problem. But it does get a bit more interesting uh, down here. We have a bit more of a block diagram modulator, demodulator, because it has to signal interrogation detector. It's got to do all that sort of jazz. Uh, it says recharge port here, which um, they've obviously gone away from that because this is a uh, primary uh, cell inside here. And we've actually got some schematic stuff. Look, ADC touch. So they're, um, they're not implementing that with your more traditional thing and it's interesting that they've got a uh, discrete driver transistors for the leds here we didn't see those in there so they've obviously done away with them you don't need it i mean you just pulse on a led you could easily do that with the uh micro so uh, they've got the part numbers and everything though in the pattern and here's the uh loop antenna here's the rf detection uh circuitry four diodes we did see a whole bunch of uh, diodes in there so that's how they're getting the RF detection out. They're detecting the uh, modulation. Uh, well, they're detecting the interrogation uh, frequency, the interrogation pulses that we uh, saw before. That's boring. We've got a micro. Oh, look, pin numbers. There we go. Can we work out what uh, maybe I'll link in the uh, pattern down below. Maybe we can actually get what uh, micro that is because there you go. Is that three? Oh no, 13.56. So they are using, they're, is that a 13.56 megahertz crystal there? Interesting. Anyway, we should be able to get what uh, micro that they're actually using there. But as I said, we didn't see any uh, discrete MOSFETs on the output. So obviously it's... Uh, it's changed, and then they go into how it all works with the uh, web browser. What? Serving processing system? Uh, are they trying to do a broader, get a broader pattern so that they can potentially pattern troll people? I hope not. And then we've got the physical embodiment of the thing. And, uh, oh, look, even example, uh, pass, like, you know, example applications and everything else. And then we've got a uh, photo of the thing. And... But uh, it, used to, it looks like it used to be called PayGuard. There you go. And it's changed. And that's the end of the pattern. Anyway, I'll link it in down below if you want to see all the gory details. So there you have it. There's a look inside the Armour Card, an RFID active jammer. And it's probably going to do the business. But ultimately, I can't see why you would bother having something like this. And, you know, it's, battery's going to run out in a few years' time. Just... If you're worried about security with this thing, just put some owl foil inside your or your wallet or your purse or whatever, or wrap your passport in it, or you know, get one of the shield in. You can for a much cheaper cost. This was fifty-eight dollars Australian, much cheaper. You can get just the shield in uh, sleeves that you can put your passport or your credit cards into. But ultimately, as I said in the previous video. The threat is actually really quite low. Yes, it's possible that people can actually skim you by walking past you or whatever, sitting in proximity to you wherever you are, but they've got to be able to do an authorised transaction. It's not like they can just steal the details of your card and then go off and uh, do a transaction later. They've got to do a real-time transaction right there, pretty much. So, you know... Uh, Yes, in theory it's possible. In practice, the risk is, you know, fairly low and you're limited. In Australia, we're limited to $100 uh, per transaction here and you're not legally liable for it anyway. If somebody skims it, so not a huge deal. But these things, um, uh, this armor card in particular, um, from what uh, they were telling me, is selling like hotcakes at uh, JB Hi-Fi. So everyone's buying one of these things and I got, like, the last one there crazy and i don't know anyway i don't i don't see the point in having an active jammer like this it's just it's just a complex solution to a problem that either a has no real risk to it or b has a simple solution in the alfoil or a shielding thing so yeah it's neat but yeah you're wasting your time i wouldn't i wouldn't buy one so if you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up and all that sort of jazz. And uh, you can always discuss it down below. Link to the EV blog forum, YouTube comments. Try to read them all. Catch you next time.
Hi, just a quick impromptu teardown video of one of these RFID cards. This one is actually the card to access my uh, lab here in the EV blog corporate towers. All right, I'm down in the car park and uh, about the only time that uh, something like this uh, little DSO quad will actually be uh, useful, I think. I'm just going to check the uh, frequency of this thing and see what we get, see whether or not it's the one of the 125 uh, kilohertz uh, frequency readers, because um, I don't know. So let's, uh, there we go, that's 125 kilohertz one. I'm just uh, 